What if you first started one day earlier on the 10th of November 1444 rather than the 11th of November 1444? Well, surprisingly enough, that one day is one of the greatest days for the Ottomans and one of the worst days for the Christian world of the 15th century. Why am I saying this? It's because it was the day when the Battle of Varna happened at which the Crusaders met the Ottomans and as you can probably imagine, the Ottomans won the 60,000 strong Ottoman army crushing the 30,000 crusader army near the town of Varna. To better understand the effects of this particular engagement and why it was so vastly important, we need to understand the political landscape of 15th century Europe and Middle East. Albeit E4 is probably not the greatest game when it comes to historical accuracy for the 15th century, there is no other game that portrays it any way better. There are mods out there like Victorium Universalis and Beyond Typus, which show a much better and more historically accurate map of 1444. I am going to be showing you today the extended timeline mod, however, because this one actually lets you go back one day before the Battle of Varna occurred. As consequence, take note, the map itself is not extremely historically accurate. A lot of territories around here are not given to the right countries, and a lot of countries are missing overall from the map. In 1444, the biggest players in Europe were of course the Holy Roman Empire which in our game is depicted via the Imperial map mode where we see that the Emperor, the Electors and every single member of the HRE was its own individual separate nation but they formed a loose coalition let's say of nations that essentially were the HRE. This is very historical, at the time feudalism was still around albeit on its last legs that's for sure, the 15th century also making the transition between feudalism and modern societies more or less it was a painful transition it took a few hundred years until we reached the point where today we are of course a free world living in free countries at least in parts of the world and we don't have to pay monthly rent to somebody that owns our house or our land which is basically what feudalism was the nobility or the kings or whatever you want to call them owned the properties and rented out to the peasants that were basically living there paying their tributes and such. Totally different from uh, how 90% of us are paying rent to just survive nowadays. Totally different. Not the same thing at all. Aside from the Holy Roman Empire, which definitely played its part in the politics of Europe, the actual big players were the French crown, which just like the HRE did have a lot of smaller counties and duchies and so on that were subjects of the uh, crown of France. But unlike the HRE, the crown of France actually owned a massive amount of land as the did the crown of England and so on, with what we see on the map in EU4 here being land actually owned by the crown, albeit some parts should not be owned by the crown, it is minor details, they did own pretty much this entirety here. Also want to mention that Burgundy at the time was in fact a country that was a part of both France and the HRE, the county of Burgundy, which is these provinces in our game, I believe it's Dijon, Belançon and Salon, were the county of Burgundy that was a part of the HRE and the Duke of Burgundy did have to pay his dues to the HRE Emperor, did have to listen to the HRE Emperor when it came to matters involving his HRE provinces, i.e. these lands here and some other parts of the north, but at the same time, the Duchy of Burgundy, which is Oxera, Chardonnay, Nevers, and so on, were a part of the French crown, so when it came to matters involving these provinces, he again had to pay his dues to the French crown and listen to what the French king has to say in certain matters within his own country. Burgundy was not the only one in this situation. There were many countries around the European continent and around the world in that particular situation where politically you would be a vassal of one nation, a tributary of another, and a part of another. It's just weird, but it is how the political landscape was at the time. You didn't have as well-defined borders as with national borders in modern times, and the concept of nationalism itself was pretty much non-existent. You could be German working for the Polish crown and you would consider yourself a subject of Poland, you wouldn't even think about the 
the fact that you know i'm fighting against other germans and i am german as well that that just i don't know maybe it crossed their mind but it's not something that historically played part in any of the engagements of the 15th century now that i've discussed about the feudal system that was on its last legs during the 15th century and how this plays in the european continent's political affairs it is time to discuss about the ottoman empire also one of the central figures of the 1444 start date and why starting this game one day earlier would mean a huge difference for the ottomans unlike most of european nations which had a strong feudal system the ottoman system was very very different let's say it was a lot more centralized than the european feudal system was with the ottoman sultan holding ultimate authority and whatever pashas or beyliks or whatever he assigned not having the same degree of autonomy and strength that the various dukes and princes around europe had in relation to their kings and emperors that is one of the reasons why the ottomans were extremely successful in the 15th century in their conquest because they were not as disunited as the europeans well the various europeans were but that was done through the use of fear and crushing any sort of dissent that might have happened in their lands or around their lands even murad ii sultan murad ii was the one that took charge against the crusaders it's a little bit of a strange history around murad because technically he stopped being the sultan of the ottoman empire prior to the battle in august 1444 but he was the one that did lead the armies of the empire in 1444 as his son mehmed ii was only 12 years old at the time on the 12th of june 1444 the ottomans made peace with the hungarians a peace which was supposed to last for 10 years but the hungarians broke that peace when they relaunched and those particular events led to uh, murad taking charge and coming back on the throne essentially for the needed battles to take place against the uh, crusaders cardinal julian cesarini convinced the hungarian king to break that truce thinking that they would have the upper hand because the ottomans had certain issues and were busy in the anatolian side of their country fighting against the karamans at the time since the karamanids led by ibrahim bey tried to take advantage of the crusaders attacking the balkan side of the ottoman empire to siege down the cities of ankara and kutahia destroying both cities as consequence for their treachery or surprise attack whatever you want to call it the karamanids suffered a pretty serious blowback they were forced by the ottomans to accept their terms and much later down the line around 1480s 1487 i think when they were completely destroyed the karaman population was displaced they basically were put in other parts of the ottoman empire so they would never be a unified entity to ever rebel against the ottomans again in the future and also a pretty sizable population of karaman was actually decimated this was a faith shared by most of the ottoman empire's enemies and why they were extremely feared both within the middle east and within the european continent i think that the ottomans were massive adepts of the uh, roman tactics of divide and conquer and they added a sprinkle of fear on top of that because you could see that really easily starting with the makeup of the ottoman army you have two armies essentially the rumelian army which was troops recruited from the balkan area of the ottoman empire and you had the anatolian army essentially troops from the anatolian parts and normally you would have a divide between these two troops because a lot of the times the rumelians did have a lot of europeans rather than turks in the army and were used against each other whenever there was rebellions on either side of the empire as they would act with little to no repercussions and no emotions because they wouldn't care about people that are not from their particular area of the empire that is just really really smart definitely a divide and conquer or divide and put down rebellion sort of situation i also want to take a closer look at the area where the battle of varna took place the city of varna is located by the coastline of the black sea today varna is a thriving city with a booming local tourist industry but in the middle ages and during renaissance varna was actually a very important strategic location and the exact location of the battle well it took place somewhere around this area north of lake varna and right here at the time it was predominantly just farmlands with the city of varna being only this particular area that i'm highlighting essentially the old town of varna as the population grew and as times changed of course the city itself also expanded considerably the crusader army was camped around this particular area 30,000 strong soldiers 
Jews made up of the various knights of Christendom, including elite Hungarian and Polish lifeguards of the King Vladislav III, who was only 20 years old of age when the battle happened. The real mastermind and the actual commanding general of the army was likely Janku de Hunedoara or Janos Huniadi, whatever you want to call him. His nickname was uh, the White Knight of Christendom or Puki as his wife liked to call him, but we don't like to call him Puki because it doesn't sound professional, I guess. And yes, you're right, I did make that up, but his wife definitely called him something else and we can all assume that was either Puki, Shmigadoob or Big D. I don't know, could have been any of those. You can definitely assert from this particular location that the Crusaders were basically trapped. The Papal State's delegate, Julian Cesarini, wanted to withdraw from the battle, but as Yanku actually pointed out, they are surrounded. Might not be very obvious when you just look at the map, but think about it from their perspective. They had a 30,000 strong army, and they had a massive sea to the east, they had the Lake of Varna to the south, and to the north they had the mountain range with thick dense forests, which even today are very hard to pass through. Imagine passing through this with an organized army. Now you might be thinking, why didn't everybody just pick up their spear and just go through the mountain trails? If you did that, the Ottomans would just wait on the other end with their fast moving cavalry and pick you off one by one, or just trail through the path and pick you off one by one. That's what historically happened when people became disorganized and fled on their own accord, which is what every army in history avoided doing. That's why you would not be able to go through through this mountain range or around it somehow the only option they had was to go exactly towards the west and that's exactly where the 60,000 Ottoman army was waiting for them and pushing in towards them. Yanko knew that the only option they have was to fight them. The Crusaders formed a defensive line between Lake Varna and the Frunga Plateau roughly between three to four kilometers in length meaning the troops were fairly thinly stretched but they had a strong center made up of the actual heavily armored lifeguards of King Vladislav from his Hungarian and Polish contingents with Julian Cesarini being on one of the flanks and the various other nobles that took part in the crusade on the other flank. Initially Vladislav gave control of the army to John Hunyadi and that proved to be the right choice since the crusaders managed to hold off the Ottomans but seeing as his heavy cavalry charge was very effective effective against the Ottoman troops, King Vladislav decided to not take the cautious approach of Hunyadi and decided to take charge of his strong heavy cavalry right into the massive Ottoman blob and that proved to be a very fatal decision. I actually want to do a proper video on the Battle of Varna so I'm curious if you guys are interested in that. If we get 5,000 likes on this video in the first week after it's out so I know you are interested in such a video or not, then I will make a proper Battle of Varna video but I'm not gonna talk about it in too much detail right now. You can get more information on the battle from uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is like a very basic information, or from Stephen Turnbull's The Ottoman Empire, which covers most of the major events between 1326 and 1699, the initial phase of the Ottoman Empire. That's a book I highly recommend if you like history, by the way, and especially history from this area. But we will be going back to our E4, because the big question we want to answer is, of course, what if our game started a single day early? Now, we're gonna click here, and boom, we are on the 10th of November. Sadly, because of the way that EU4 is actually coded, they need to go back one month to still be at war with the Ottomans. So we are going to the 31st of October to still have the war between the Ottoman Empire and the uh, Poles. We go to the diplomat mode, you can see that Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, Moldova, Wallachia, Serbia, the Papal States are all at war with the Ottomans. And despite the game not having any sort of scripted battles between the Crusaders or anything of the sorts in Varna, it's the game starting one day early makes a huge difference because a unified Polish front here means you would have to face off the entirety of Central Europe from day one as the Ottomans. You would have to essentially fight in order to survive as the Ottomans instead of having a free peaceful beginning where you decide which smaller nation you're going to be attacking and munching into. Not only that, but the Poles also have the uh, DU over Lithuania so they can call in Lithuania too if they want to, meaning you'd end 
end up in a war against basically half of Europe here that you have to win. Of course, it is the Ottomans and in E4, the Ottomans are really strong, but that would definitely set you back a lot. And if a player is playing as Poland and has half of Europe against the Ottomans, then you can almost rest assured that the Balkans are going to be free before too soon has passed. Vladislav still being in charge of Poland and having the union over Hungary means that Hungary would never have become a junior partner of the Austrians. So that would be a very interesting alternate scenario to see in our timeline. We're also in the uh, war with the Teutons at the very beginning as the Poles, but uh, this is actually not supposed to be. Historically speaking, the Civil War was over a couple of years before the 1444. I don't know if it's 1442 or 1440, but the dispute was already settled, so there would be no Civil War as such, no involvement of the Teutons against the Lithuanians and Poles by this point, meaning it realistically would have been a 1v1 between the greater Polish crown and the Ottomans. Pretty funny to think how a single day made such a huge impact on the world that we live in today. And even in the game that we love to play, if it started on the 10th of November, not the 11th of November, we would essentially be playing a completely different game with a completely different balance. If I'm being totally honest with you guys, 11th of November should also not be a peace between the Ottomans and the Poles, because even though the Ottomans did win at Varna, there were still engagements after they won that battle. Parts of the uh, Crusader contingent that managed to escape from the Crusade of Varna, including John Huniadi, made their way out of the battle. Vladislav III did die at the ripe age of 20, but that was not the end of the conflict. There were many following up battles after the Battle of Varna, and to be truthful, almost all of the Crusaders were captured by the Ottomans in the ensuing battles afterwards. I've loaded up Victor Universalis because unlike vanilla this actually portrays a much better depiction of uh, the European map at the time it's not 100% accurate but it is a lot more accurate than the base game is you can see here that the uh, Byzantines did have possession of most of the lands up until the area where the battle took place but even though in name the Byzantines did have this uh, under control the Ottomans could have literally just walked through it they didn't really give much of a schnapps whether the Byzantines would uh, be angry about it and you know what what I have to say it, Victorum Universalis does have a better understanding of the uh, size of the Ottoman army in 1444 than the base game does, because the Ottomans did have 60,000 units at uh, Varna. Granted, these guys are not at Varna, but at least we have 60,000 somewhere, right? I also like to see that we have Lovesh shown as an independent Bulgarian nation here. This is, in fact, the Lovesh stronghold or Lovesh fortress, which actually did survive until 1446. That's when it was eventually captured by the Ottomans. The Second Bulgarian Empire did fall in 1396, so it survived for an extra 50 years. It's not the only holdout of the Bulgarian Empire. There were multiple smaller holdouts around Bulgaria, but the last one to survive was Lovish, which was captured in 1446. There were even rebels, as they are called by the Ottoman Empire historically, that took part in the Crusade of Vorna. Bulgarian rebels that helped the Crusader side in the hopes that maybe they will see an independent Bulgaria in the aftermath of the crusade that sadly failed for the crusaders but luckily failed for the Ottomans so I guess it's a matter of perspective whether you're okay or not okay with it have failing or not. Also emboldened by the crusades one of the most loyal of uh, subjects of the Ottoman crown Georgi Kastrioti Skandenberg rebelled against the Ottomans thinking that maybe he can secure an independent Albania for himself. He was actually pretty successful. He led a lot of guerrilla style warfare battles against the Ottomans and is said to have personally slain thousands of uh, Ottoman troops by himself. So he is pretty accurately depicted as a 656 over here. He faked having converted to Islam for 20 years and faked loyalty until the right moment to strike in the hopes that he would make his people a free nation. In the long run obviously it failed. The Albanians were reintegrated into the Ottoman Empire and the Albanians were one of the targeted areas areas of mass conversion to Islam together with the uh, Bosnian side. The Ottomans tended to prioritize converting the Catholics to Islam because the Orthodox Christians didn't really care much about the papacy and what the Pope had to say, but the Catholic subjects within the uh, Ottoman Empire still were Catholic and of course they did care about the Pope. Now obviously the Pope wasn't the biggest fan of the Ottoman Empire, so that's why a lot of targeted campaigns were towards more radical from the Ottoman perspective. Christian faiths, like a 
Catholicism. And I say radical because it was harder for the Ottomans to keep the Catholics in check. So now I want to do something that I think is going to be a lot of fun for all of us to watch. I'm going to set up a war between Poland and the Allies within that particular crusade and the Ottomans. And we're just going to consider that the battle didn't happen at all or that the outcome was not really decisive. So we can see what a proper battle that continued between the two sides would have been like. Because if Vladislav didn't die, the crusade would have continued. And even if they still lost the Battle of Varna, the overall outcome of the war might have been very different. All right, with a little bit of uh, editing, I restarted the conflict, essentially. Oh, actually, I forgot to add the Papal States to this. <laughs> um, You know what? It's fine. Papal States didn't really get too involved in the conflict as it is, right? So I'm going to set myself as observer now. And I want to see how exactly this is going to play out. I want to see how the Ottoman AI is going to handle this situation. They have all the aces up their sleeves, let's face it, because look at that, they're crushing the Valachian army. They already have fortifications in uh, Giurgiu or Kule, as apparently they call it. So they have a safe passage over to this side of the Danube. They don't need to worry about doing any dangerous or treacherous landings, amphibious landings on that side. Whilst the coalition members, the Poles, they may be a lot of them, but they have small armies, and unless they band together to fight against the Ottomans, this is not going to go on their side, that is for sure. Look at them trying to pile up as many units as possible in one army in order to relieve the siege of Ilfov. Holy mother of God, that is actually a huge... It's like a swarm of ants, isn't it? Okay, now for some reason they're backing off or the AI is just struggling with it. They are fighting. Zekirlan's fighting one of the Ottoman armies. Nobody's reinforcing, though. Nobody's trying to help them out. That is a problem. You guys should be working together. For that matter, I probably should have added Lovish to the coalition members, but hey, it's fine. Lovish is gonna have their own time. I was actually curious if you guys want me to do a Bulgaria attempt at survival as Lovish with the Victorum Universalis mod. They're basically absolutely gonna die off very fast. The Ottomans even start with the core on them, so it's gonna be one of the toughest challenges, but if you guys are interested, let me know in the comments. Tell you what, if we get 170,000 subs by the end of April, not only will I do a massive multiplayer, but I'll use this mod and I'll play as Bulgaria, okay? That's a real challenge right there, boys. Okay, they've actually managed to push back the Ottomans or managed to make the Ottomans go somewhere else, I guess. How is this battle going? Let's see. The Ottomans are getting really good dice rolls there. Bohemians managed to get their asses kicked. But let's see what the actual ledger is saying here. The Ottomans still have 71,000 units, bro. What? Okay. Yeah, yeah. My money's on the Ottomans here. I'm not gonna lie. I still feel like the Ottomans would have won this. <laughs> oh, I may have spoken too soon. They've just amassed a 70,000 strong army and I'm, I'm not sure why they're not attacking still. Come on, coalition boys. You really need to push for that fortification, guys. Okay, we're now almost at 100,000 overall on the coalition. How are they managing to pull that many units? Now, I know some of you might be thinking, oh, it's not fair. You make so many nation against Ottoman. Hey, man. Hey, this is historical, okay? This is historical gameplay right here. <laughs> yep, they managed to take Ilfov. And let's see if these guys are gonna try and take it back. It's got only 155 garrisons, so it's actually doable if they push it. If they manage to break the walls and assault it, they could easily take that back. Okay, not many battles, surprisingly. The AI is prioritizing sieging down fortifications all around the uh, border of the Ottoman Empire rather than actually engaging in proper engagements. Engaging in proper engagements. Yep, yep, that's... Um, I do be, do be very educado. Edu, educado. I am. Observe. Oh, wow. They've got 28% war score. What? Let me tag into these bad boys. I want to see what exactly is their war score here. They got most of this from Defender Goal, Protect Ishkachi, and from Battles, obviously. So, theoretically, the Ottomans are a little bit ahead. Let's check what the Poles are doing. The Poles are out of manpower already. However, they do seem to have a lot of money, so they probably can recruit some mercenary companies along the way. Just like historically, Huniadi recruited a massive mercenary army. Half the Crusader army was basically Puniadi's mercenaries. He spent a massive fortune, his own fortune. He was so dedicated to his particular cause of fighting the Ottomans, I guess. I also need to give uh, massive kudos to the Victorum Universalis modding team. They've done a really good job. They have actual pictures of the locations from uh, wherever province you click on, if it's not like a General Grassons or something. Look at this. You have a medieval Bucharest image, Turgoviste, Bucej as well, and then you have the General Grasslands, of course, also in the 
general fields but like if it's a big city you will see a different image let's check constantinople there you go we got constantinople itself we also have the galata area of uh, constantinople where the famous galata tower is and the walls of constantinople in theodosium and then iskice has what is this I don't know. This must be some famous mosque from there. No clue what it is. The Ottomans are losing ground though. They've actually lost 10 war scores. And the Crusaders have started sieging down Silistria slowly. They're making their way back to Varna. Hey man, if only they played EU4 and tested their tactics before they launched the Crusade. Am I right guys? Wait, what? Oh, the Ottomans won. The Ottomans won. They took land. They took three provinces. Braila, Burlad, and uh, Abarcha. What the schnapps is? I don't know what that is. This is where I'm from in real life by the way from Galatz this small little city over here well I'm technically from the countryside but I lived in Galatz a while so I guess we have it settled boys even though <laughs> even if the Crusaders won the Battle of Varna the Ottomans would have still come out on top clearly proven by this uh, video game that a hundred percent simulates exactly what would have happened no way uh, around it this is the truth trust me bro <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy this video I'm really trying to make more history oriented content as I really really enjoy history and I'm curious what you guys guys think about this type of content so let me know in the comment section below and if you enjoyed this check out this awesome video up next and i want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons channel members and twitch subscribers i would not be able to do this without all your support 